It's mad when you're looking at a 14 year old and you're thinking he could have. He could kick my <laughs> He could kick my <laughs> He couldn't kick my <laughs> Yeah. I would absolutely like open a coffee shop in Silver Lake. But you think I'd be in the coffee. apron just manning like, okay, what do you want, Phil? Maybe that's a spin-off series, the coffee shop. <laughs> the coffee Black shop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Entertainment Weekly's Around the Table. We're talking Umbrella Academy season three spoilers. This isn't your home. What are you talking about? This is the Umbrella Academy. This is the Sparrow Academy. You know, there's there's a yeah. there's an element of of anger that that happens at least from Diego's perspective of not having his home, not having his house anymore, and being uh, overtaken by this other team. Um, so aside from being displaced as a number two, now he's displaced from his home, and there's a lot of confusion that happens. I think uh, within the umbrellas of like, what is the next step that we should take? And everyone kind of has their own, you know. Uh, uh, you know want at that point and diego is obviously wanting to take back the house and and be a child you know and take dad's love again oh. and, and let's not forget they had a rough season two in dallas so everyone's ready to relax and just have a, a comfortable sleep in their beds except for they're not their beds this isn't their home anymore and dad looks a little weird plus there's uh seven other people yeah. in the house that say that's this is our house now and plus you question your reality if you went back to your parents house and there was other kids there going this is our house what are you doing here because you know you'd it'd be an existential question going do am i me you know it's yeah. like if, if you had a if you got a clone of yourself <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later the clone went no i'm the original <laughs> i'm the real you one go, well, how would yeah. you know that you were the original so there's a sort of a weird Bizarre, like, uh, can we trust our own memories? I think we we responded to each other by kind of huddling together and going, you exist and I exist, right? Yeah, no, I know who you are as long as you know who I am because nobody else does. It does make us quite lost at the end. I mean, you see that scene where we're all sort of like walking through the park sort of aimlessly. because We're just yeah. like displaced now. It's a new timeline and we're completely yeah. lost. We don't know what the next step is. And uh, yeah, like he's said earlier we're just looking for a place to crash by the end of season two we're just looking for a break looking for a, a nap and a schwitz it was great to have all these new personalities on set. Um, yeah, yeah they, they, they were a good bunch to come on. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty great because we had a bunch of time beforehand, before we actually even got on set, where we were doing, you know, rehearsals with those guys and doing dance rehearsals and even to when we were in quarantine all together, doing Zoom rehearsals for the dance. So we got to know each other pretty well. So when we first got on to set together, there was like, what, 12, 13, 14 of us all on set together. So that was a great way to kind of bond with them all. And then we would all, you know, obviously start developing our individual friendships with everyone. And I think it was a morale booster for everybody. You guys had been locked down in quarantine, uh, hadn't really seen each other. And then all of you got on set and started to uh, do a little footloose action. I think that was uh, not only brought you guys up, but was definitely a booster for the crew for mm. those uh, four or five days that you guys danced your hearts out. And we had that time in the dance studio too, before we True. got on set with the Sparrows, where in one room we were all masked up rehearsing the dance. And then in another room, we were masked up doing like fight training with, with uh, uh, Master Tommy Chang. So yeah, everybody was checking out everyone else's moves, <laughs> checking out the Sparrows moves going, right, who's tasty? Who could I take? <laughs> <laughs> I think, was little, I think there was a little competitiveness of who had the best moves. Let's be honest. Yeah, oh yeah. Was oh, of of the umbrella. Come on, big time. Yeah. yeah, and I think that was that was cultivated on your part, Steve. It was. It was set up that you guys would be in competition <laughs> from the very first day. Yeah, because it seems like the Sparrows were always like doing dance training right before we arrived there too. So you're like, yeah. oh man. Oh yeah, yeah. you're the team. Guys are great. That was my you're the teams on the ice working yeah. twice as hard. <laughs> and then you had Grace right in the middle, just coming in like, can I just dance too? I'm gonna brag for a little bit. These guys not only. Um, you know, when I went into sort of putting in the Footloose dance, I wasn't completely convinced that all 
14 people, actually 13 people in a cube could actually pull off the dance without <laughs> dance doubles. And to their credit, everybody learned the dance. We never used a single dance double. These guys did every move that you see on screen, which is amazing, by the nice. way. Ben Reno, you look so much better alive than you do dead. Am I right? Except that haircut. What the hell did you just say? Come on, come on, stop with all the hostility, Mr. Grumpy Pants. Oh, wow, nice scar. Muy macho. Shut your mouth. At first, great joy on my part. I was just happy to see that he was alive again. Until he punched you in the face. Until he punches me in the face, yeah. Right. And then I missed him being a ghost very quickly. Yeah. Highly yeah. necessary. <laughs> When we jumped here, we created a time paradox. Our little paradox brought forth a freaking Kugel Blitz. What the hell is a Kugel Blitz? Essentially, we're screwed. Yeah. Uh, it's, what is it? It's quite ultimate, isn't it? It's ultimate. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, it's very inescapable with inescapable with the commission stuff there's like a handbook there's like a way that you deal with this i'm loving what you're doing by <laughs> the way uh yeah there's always like a guide and a way forward and mm. there's no next step for the grandfather paradox and so very quickly i think once you understand the parameters of such a thing everything just becomes hopeless and you sort of have an episode eight where everything is just about bonding and acceptance and uh, it almost brings a sort of peace that we've never had with each time that we've supposedly saved the world. Where? It's mommy. Mommy. Huh. <coughs> oh. <coughs> Who the hell are you? Patrick. Uh, uh, mommy. What's mommy. going on? Who is this woman? Where, where, where's my baby? You have 10 seconds to leave. Where is Claire? Lady, there's no Claire here. You're scaring her. I'm so Something is wrong. Something is very wrong. I think she takes a big gamble in leaving Ray to find her daughter and be reunited with her daughter. And I think that's a huge part of her journey this season, and that's definitely her guiding light. But I also think everything that she went through in the 60s, the fact that she, you know, was quite frankly still alive to be found by her siblings and everything that she survived and witnessed, like that's undoubtedly going to leave an amount of trauma and and lingering side effects and so i think that's also a lot of of um allison's journey this season is kind of her trauma coming to the surface and and how she does and does not decide to to deal with it and um i think i think she decides to lean into it and and use that because she's really angry and i think she's got a lot of um suppressed emotions and, and feelings and, you know, generational trauma um, that's kind of coming to the surface this season. But you know, I think, Emmy, what you did so well is that I never felt the character, despite what was overt, you could always tell that the character was just in pain, you know, missing Ray, missing her daughter. I mean, you could, it was visceral, the pain that she was feeling inside, which I thought was such a great place to see, you know, that journey that Allison goes through in season three. Hey, Emmy, it's good to see you. Mm -hmm. Hi, friends. Hey, Emmy. Hi, babe. Remember when I told you that my family is all that I have? Yeah. I'm starting to wonder if I even have that. I'm so sorry. That's fine. I'm just so tired of fighting it. The only thing we really have in common is childhood trauma. I just, I'm not sure if that's enough to keep us together anymore, you know? Actually, I do. Yeah. You know, there is one thing I'm a thousand percent sure about. Your math isn't great, but we can work with that. Diego and Luther have come on a great journey like together, but also individually, you know, and like you say, I think it's uh, it's really nice to see both of them become kind of in, in a way more grown up, but also more kind of relaxed in in this season. And I think, you know, Luther's gone through so much trauma in season one and two. And I think the weight of being number one, the father issues, 
being on the moon for four years, all these things that we've <laughs> we've seen him be traumatized by. I think when we leave the Sparrow Academy and, and five breaks it down and says, well, you know, apart from doppelgangers, we've really not got a lot to worry about here. I think he kind of relaxes a little bit. I think the first time we see Luther kind of go, oh, cool, I'll just go for a run in the morning. And uh, <laughs> he kind of lets it all go. And then, of course, he, he then gets kidnapped and meets Sloane, who becomes very quickly the love of his life because she brings something out in him that he's, he's never felt before because she sees him for who he really is, you know, the Luther without the body, without the super suit, with all these, you know, other factors that defined Luther before. So he's able to relax and have fun and get laid, baby. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you had gravity uh, sex? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dancing on the floor. I, I was going to ask about love at first sight, but then gravity sex just wrecked that question. Just it wiped it out. <laughs> yeah, just put, took, took it in a whole different place. Gravity sex sounds exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not. Surprisingly not. Yeah. I feel like the, you know, the evolution of of uh, ourselves in the show, just as people, um, has really taken a, a, almost like a, a growth in also seeing these characters develop. So, you know, going into like the first few seasons, you know, there was this seriousness that um, was something that I was really trying to portray based on the fact that I just didn't feel like I was good enough. So then as the seasons go along, you kind of relax into it. You start to understand, you know, that you don't have to play it one way the entire time. So then you start finding different ways to do things. And so, you know, and then obviously, you know, they cast Rituaria as Lila and she has this banter and this kind of fun energy and always willing to play that Diego starts developing in his own way based on that dynamic. And by the time we get to season three, it's like, you no know, number one and number two, like, you know, it's, I see Tom as my brother. So when we're doing scenes, it's, you're eventually gonna see that come out just like this, you know? Hello, lover. Holy shit. He really came back. You miss me already? That's too bad. I'm not here to stick around just doing a quick little drop off. Of what? Our son, Diego, meet Stan. Say hello, Stanley. Hello, Stanley. Wait, what? Hey. Hey, 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 this is... Hmm. Hey, this is... Hmm. Uh, it's a joke, right? Bet your boys can swim fast. Yeah, <laughs> joke's on me there. I've had Stan for 12 years. It's time for you to do your part. Have fun bonding. Be good for mommy. I loved working with him. Um, I think he was such a delight on set. Uh, it's like very talented, but just like a playful, fun like um, presence. Uh, I think it was it was really fun, just the three of us hanging out. And when he left, we we really felt it. We missed him a lot. And even on um, like the weekends, we would take him, we'd hang out on a Saturday and go boxing together. We we really we really fell in love with him. So when he was taken from the show, we we really like we were heartbroken for a bit, like parents would be. Yeah, we mourned missing their child. <laughs> it was like watching you three walk around. It was like watching like this little family. Yeah, it was. <laughs> he looks like little David. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was like... Yeah, he was dangerous. He was, yeah. He was, especially yeah, with that pool kid. He's a tidy boxer. He's lethal. It's mad when you're looking at a 14-year-old and you're thinking, he could have He me. could kick my <laughs> He could kick my <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't kick my Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He couldn't reach my head, but he could kick <laughs> my ass. Yeah. 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 Klaus Hargreaves, reanimation training. Trial commencing. 1.15 p.m. Steve would constantly send me text message threats going, next time I kill you, that's it. That's it, done. You're not coming back. <laughs> but I can't be killed off, man. Yeah. I'm immortal, man. I can, I, I'm, a, I'm the king of the realm of death. You can't kill me. Where are you going? Where am I going to go? There's nowhere to go except for unless there's purgatory or limbo or something. I, however, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> immortal. <laughs> So I had the fear. Yeah. <laughs> but, but Steve put my mind at ease pretty quickly. In fact, I think it was before the script came out, right, Steve? I think you texted me yeah. going, 
you're going to get the episode just so you know you're not actually dead. <laughs> well, I don't want to yeah. freak you out. I don't want to be like, leave you for three weeks hanging and say, that's yeah. it. Uh, I'm going to look for a new employment. I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> well, that's it. Agent. Yeah. 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 Death Death is nothing on this show. Reginald yeah. Hargreaves has been dead since season, season one. Season one. Episode one. This wasn't part of the deal. You're hurting them. I can't stop now. You shut down the machine. What machine? I don't understand. The hotel was just a facade. We're stuck inside a machine in another dimension. Whoever created the universe built this place. Okay, what does any of that have to do with them? It's it's tricky with with Red in this in this particular mm. timeline because I think they all have this image of Reggie, no matter what he's claiming to be, or even when, you know, Klaus comes back and is like, he's no, no, he's different, he's different. You can't get away from the trauma that that image of a man put us through. Like he's he's still the same guy to us, you know? So I think that's the, I mean, and Luther, and I think Luther and Diego as well, like they have particular daddy issues. To get over that, to get over what he was to us is uh, such a huge task as so like as trying to like get around but i think for luther you know he's the moment where he has the hug with Hargre. that's like really no matter how much he's been fighting it that's all he's ever really wanted from him you know it's that that closeness and yeah. just having you know his father have you know his approval and you know all of that so it's yeah. uh, it's a really interesting dynamic this season this kind of new Hargreaves and how yeah. they look at that how they, yeah, how they you, see him. You, all, you also share all of you guys. The one interesting thing is you share with the sparrows is the same collective trauma of having the same father. I mean, that's the one thing that you've all experienced is you've had the same dad. It's, and and yeah. it's funny because when you talk about the dynamic between, uh, you know, siblings and dad, especially in the earlier seasons and going to this one, and this is just the thought that just came to me right now, which is like, if Diego having a son gives him a higher purpose, then the noise outside of that kind of dims, you know, to be concerned about other people's opinions is such a very naive and very young way of being until you find a deeper purpose, which is to be a father, to be a parent, because then you start focusing on the child and everything else kind of dims because I've, you know, even going back to the wedding with dad and he says, you, you would have been a good father. It does affect me in a certain way, but I don't think it affects me if as Diego in season one, or Diego in season two, because now he, it, there's this bigger purpose that he's driving for and is less affected by his father's comments about him not being good enough. In this season, like to say who's the villain, because I feel like everyone just got their their motives. They've all got, you know, what if you look at what Reggie's overall goal is, for him, that's real. And it's, he has true purpose for what he's trying to do. I think he... he he's happy to sort of let us sacrifices along the way, but whether you call him a villain, it's like, but you can also see it from his point of view. I think that's what's so clever about Umbrella Academy is like, sometimes there's no clear villain. It's just people who have, you know, it's like ethics or what you, what you can get behind, who you believe in, who you think is, is, is right in a scenario. The show is very gray. Like it just seems to be people going about their lives. Doesn't seem to have any sort of right and wrong. It's just the people and them dealing with the trauma. I would vote that Reg is the villain. <laughs> no, why not? All right, sure. I think I think he's a constant villain. I think he's I think he's a villain within the umbrellas. I think he's kind of they've been villainizing him since they were kids. Yeah, from that perspective, yeah. he's the villain. Yeah, whether or not he's the villain in like the grand scheme of things, I don't know. But I think for the umbrellas, he, I think they probably would consider him. Yeah. But but ultimately, if you look at the season, the very end everyone comes back, right? Everyone's yeah, alive exactly. and well. He just doesn't have to share his grander plan with anybody. So I think from his perspective, he's not a villain. That's just my sense of him. I don't think anyone That's who is a villain, villain thinks that they are yeah. a villain. Like I'm a villain and I don't think I'm a villain, right? I mean, <laughs> That's true. Very good point. Steve, you're, you're a nice I'm so mean to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> goodies. The overload. Not over body. Yeah, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, you're good. I want my wife back. Where is she, Fine? I'm glad you're alive, but please take your hand off me. Not until you give me an answer. Okay, screw this. Something's wrong. That's right, something's wrong. You're about to get your ass kicked. Yeah, kick his ass. No, you moron. My power. I can't blink. Yeah, right. That's not good. Come on, Alec. 
Because I am ghosties. This means I'm mortal again? Oh, man. Oh, wait, wait, wait. How do we get him back, you idiots? I, I would love that people to see it as, has Reggie given them a, a gift or is it a curse? Mm. Is it a good thing or a bad thing that he's done to them at the end of this season? That's all mm. I can say. That's it. Season four right there. Renewed. <laughs> I think it depends on the siblings. Like who's going to end up wrestling with this reality versus who's going to just accept it and try and cut out some semblance of a normal life. Like sort of depends on the characters and their journey. Yeah. And, and what is normal for these, th this group of siblings? No such thing. Right. I think like Lila's confidence like heavily relies on her power to be able to mimic everyone's powers. And I'd be really interesting to see her without that. And if she would be as uninhibited or aloof, maybe just like very clumsy, <laughs> bumping into walls. <laughs> I think Allison got a taste of that in season two. And I think she fell in love with that version of herself. I think without her powers, I think she was starting to very much love the woman that she was becoming mm -hmm. without it and discovering other sides of her that she didn't really know existed because she always heavily relied on the easiest way out of situations and the easiest way into situations because of her power. So I think her time in the sixties in Dallas with Ray, I think is like kind of this, this like kind of in like bubble of, of quiet that she never had before. And I think, I, I don't think she knows that she doesn't have powers at the end of the season. We, you know, we didn't really tap into that. I don't think she's tried it, but I think there's a part of me that thinks that she would be okay without it because it did seem to be easier for her her personal life when she didn't have them i think klaus is gonna at the first opportunity he's gonna he's gonna kick reggie's glass doors in and go give me back my power you <laughs> <laughs> i'm only just after mastering it and you take it away and, and you're mortal for the first time now yeah oh, yeah, yeah. klaus's mastering of the immortality which has just been taken mm -hmm. away i think has everything to do with his sense of self you know sense of self-respect and suddenly it's been taken away from him again he's like oh what am i now nothing i wish luther and 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 diego find themselves working at a theme park <laughs> <laughs> like a hot dog stand <laughs> yeah i think for some of us to open up like a bakery that'd yeah. be fun yeah. keeps talking about wanting a, have a bakery. why not <laughs> a couple of us just run in a shop that'd be fun five would absolutely like open a coffee shop in silver lake yeah, yeah. he would attend yeah. a coffee shop in silver lake <laughs> <laughs> read a newspaper enjoy the morning for once That's about yeah, it. i think he'd own it but you I think i'd be in the coffee. apron just man like okay what do you want phil yeah like a little diner no no, no i think you'd be sitting there reading your newspaper watching the regulars come in shop. i think you would thrive with yeah i think yeah, maybe that's a spin-off series, the coffee shop. At the coffee Bible. shop. <laughs> yeah. Sounds really boring. No, see, now now five, we know that five is days. the actual Gunther. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He falls in love with a 59-year-old woman. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. cool. Love that. What are you, their mascot? More like their ringer. It's a ballroom business! This is Entertainment Weekly's Around the Table with the Umbrella Academy. Watch season three, June 22nd.